The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Welcome to the year 2020. It is the first episode of the Paul Leslie Hour in 2020. A new year, a new decade. For those of you who would like to support the Paul Leslie Hour, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash the Paul Leslie Hour. A great songwriter once wrote these words, If only one voice would start it on its own, we need just one voice facing the unknown. And then that one voice would never be alone. It takes that one voice. The voice on this episode of the Paul Leslie Hour is known to pretty much all of you, I'm guessing. She has helped you probably find directions, tell you who the vice president was under a certain president. What was the name of that actor in that movie? I'm talking today with Susan C. Bennett. She is a voice actor and a singer. Her life has been an interesting one. As it has happened, her voice is one of the most recognizable in the world. She is the original voice of Siri, the Apple iPhone service with seemingly unlimited knowledge. Countless brands have used her voice, Delta Airlines, GPS systems, phone systems, McDonald's, Macy's, Papa John's, she's been featured on The Queen Latifah Show, CNN, she even read the top 10 list on The Late Show with David Letterman. As a vocalist, she's backed up the late Roy Orbison and that great American composer Burt Bacharach. Susan C. Bennett, thank you so much for inviting me into your home. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me on to the show. (laughs) It is an honor, believe me. Thank you. When did you realize that, in particular, you had a very pleasing voice? Hmm. Well, wow, that's that's, uh, an unusual question. I guess when I got into voice work accidentally, I was uh, um, singing um, out in clubs and restaurants and also doing a lot of jingle work back in the day, as they say. And um, one day I had finished singing a jingle with some other people, And the voice actor had not shown up to read the copy of the spot that we were singing for. So the owner of the studio said, Susan, you don't have an accent. Come over here and read this copy. And so I read the copy and I thought, ooh, I can do this. So I got a voice coach and then a talent agent and I've been doing voiceovers ever since. So I guess at that point is when I started to realize that, oh, oh, I I do have a voice <laughs> other than singing. So it may have been that point, I guess. What do you think it is in particular that makes a voice pleasing? Or what about from your perspectives, from your personal tastes? From my perspective, I think I think I enjoy hearing warmth in a voice. I also like to hear articulation. You know, I like to I like to hear a nice clear you know, open sounding voice. But then on the other hand, there are so many voices that aren't like that, that are so distinctive that I also like. So it's like, maybe that's just the, the general voice for an announcer or for just, you know, the type of a voice that's giving you information. That's Mm -hmm. the type of voice you'd want sort of warm, but also articulate. And I think that's probably why my voice was chosen to be the original voice of Siri. Although I don't know because Apple has not really disclosed that process Hmm. or how that happened. Yeah. A lot of people would say that you have one of the great speaking voices out there. So I would be curious to know from your, just your own personal taste, who out there has a great voice? Well, you know, there are a lot of people that I, I hear on commercials and I don't know their names, you know, so there, there are a lot of voices that I will hear and go, Oh, that, that really sounds good. You know, but I don't necessarily know who they are. As far as famous people, of course, there's always, you know, um, oh, I can see his face. Um, Fabulous actor, too. Oh, my goodness. I'm not going to be able to remember his name. What was he in? He was in Driving Miss Daisy. Morgan Freeman? Morgan Freeman, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, he has a very distinctive voice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
On the flip side, do you have any communication or speaking pet peeves? I do. I I notice a lot in the digital age, I notice a lot of sibilance in especially radio, TV commercials. You hear like, you know, throughout. And that, that I find that a little annoying, but I think that's, that's not the voice of uh, the fault of the voice actor. It's just the technology. Hmm. Let's see other, I guess other pet peeves is when people misuse words. Hmm. <laughs> you know, I heard, a, I heard a radio guy the other day say, yo, we were talking about uh, nouns and verbs and adjectives. <laughs> I'm going adjectives. Hmm. <laughs> did, did you mean adjectives or is this some other, a new word that I don't know? <laughs> One that I used to have when I was a waiter. I was a waiter for a number of years. And someone would start talking and then they would point their mouth away from you and you wouldn't be able to hear the rest of it. Right. <laughs> I would be curious to know, considering that you're a lover of music and a singer, what was the music that you grew up with? Who did you really, really like? Well, I'm I'm a boomer, so I grew up with all the uh, you know the original, and, my, and I have a brother who's eight years older. So I, you know, as from a very young age, I loved Elvis. You know, I mean, I was just a little kid, but I'd have to say my favorite music and continues to be my favorite music is the Rolling Stones, my favorite band of all time, and. I just, I, there's, I appreciate, I'd have to say I appreciate all music, but I don't necessarily want to listen. You know, there's a, a specific type of, of music that I like, and it's really hard to define it. You know, I'd have to say it's probably R&B or blues-oriented rock and roll, you know. Would you say that your your singing experience, did that in certain ways help you or teach you things about doing voiceover work? Absolutely. Interesting. You'll find that a lot of voice actors do come from music because when you're reading a script, whether it's just for announcing or whether it's an acting part, a lot of it has to do with rhythm. You know, a lot of it has to do with the speed of, of, of something that you're reading, you know, something that's, you know, is, is very energetic or something that's very exciting, of course, is going to pick up the speed a little bit. And I think musical people feel that a lot more than, than people who are non-musical. But definitely, it had a huge impact. You know, very helpful to me. I'm a big fan of composers. And I would be very, very curious to know what your perspectives on Burt Bacharach were, what it was like meeting him, what he was like. Well, it was just, it was one of the uh, the absolute pinnacles of my career to work with him. And I was on a fairly short tour with him. Uh, he was touring the South and Southwest. And it was just absolutely amazing. When I first met him, he brought a couple of people from his rhythm section to work with the, he was starting off at Chastain Park with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. And he did bring his own little, you know, rhythm section. He also brought two singers with him. And then he hired three other singers locally and I was, you know, very thrilled to be one of those people. Hmm. So we were in the penthouse of the uh, the hotel that I think, I think is a holiday. And now it's right there at Powers Ferry in 285. And we went up into this giant penthouse and there's Bert sitting at a piano. And it was just sort of like, oh my God. <laughs> and so we were going through parts and everything. And at one point he turns to me and he goes, Susan, what do you think about this part? And I kind of, <laughs> turned around and looked looked for whatever Susan he might have been addressing. And I thought, oh, my God, he's talking to me. He's asking my opinion. So it was a thrill. It was an absolute thrill. And part of the thrill was not just getting to sing those amazing songs with Bert, but surrounded by an orchestra. It was uh, one of the first experiences I'd had doing that. And that is just thrilling. I mean, it's just surrounded by just all of this amazing sound. So it was an incredible experience. How cool. Do you have a favorite Burt Bacharach song? I do. Anyone who had a heart just kills me. I, I have trouble singing it because I had, can't not cry during it. <laughs> mm. What tends to move you more about a song? Is it the melody or is it the lyrics? Wow. Um, 
there's a song by Sting called Fortress Around Her Around Your Heart. And, you know, I I couldn't even tell you the words, but that song just really speaks to me. So I'd have to say it's probably music first, lyrics second. Yeah. Who would you say your biggest influences as a vocalist are? That's a tough one because I have what I consider to be a very straight, straight ahead sort of pure voice, more along the lines of, um, you know, a, a young Linda Ronstadt or a Joni Mitchell type of voice rather than a Janis Joplin or a, you know, a big, big, you know, like a lot of the vocalists now just have huge voices like, you know, Mariah Carey and Christina Aguilera and, and a lot of other people. I have always wanted to have a big voice, but I do not have a big voice. To me, that's one of the fun things about aging is that my voice is lower and it is richer than it used to be. So I can belt stuff out a little better than I used to because my favorite music is belter music, hmm. you know, but I'm actually a much better folk singer or a um, jazz singer than a rock singer. So tell the listeners about the musical performances that you do these days. Well, these days I am uh, very proud to be a part of two really wonderful, fun bands. One is called Boomers Gone Wild. We play at the Crimson Moon in Dahlonega the first Sunday of every month, except February because that's Super Bowl Sunday. So we'll do the second week in February of 2020. It's hilarious. We have the best time. We sell out every time. And people just come and they dance and they make requests. And we play songs that we may not even know because we all play by ear. So if we're familiar with it, we'll just, you know, bumble through it and everybody has a great time. We play nothing but 60s and 70s rock and soul music. And because we do sell out, if you want to come see us, and I hope you do, go to the Crimson Moon website and book a table. Okay. The other band is called Canyon Ladies, and that's a fairly new band. It was invented, created, and thought up by this woman who's been a performer in Atlanta for a long time, Brene Polakoff, otherwise known as Frenchie. She used to have the band called Cowboy Envy. (laughs) And she created this band called Canyon Ladies, which is the music of the female singer-songwriters of Laurel Canyon in the 1960s. So people like Joni Mitchell, Carole King, Linda Ronstadt, although Linda didn't write very much, but Linda Ronstadt, Emmylou Harris, and all these people. So it's really fun. We've got three female vocalists, and we have two token males in the Canyon Ladies. <laughs> My husband, fabulous guitarist Rick Hinkle, and then um, our wonderful drummer, John Lewis. Well, tell us a little more about Rick Hinkle. I met him just a moment ago. Okay. He's a guitarist? He is. He's a guitarist. He has been my husband for almost 23 years. And uh, we met playing music. You know, there you go. He's an incredible guitarist. And he actually has a gold record for being the guitarist on Pac-Man Fever. Pac-Man Fever. Yeah. It was a song that was written about the first video game was Pac-Man. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm dating him by saying that. But yeah, he's a fabulous guitarist and a bass player and a great recording engineer. And so, yeah, he and I love playing together. So mm. he's he's in both of the bands that I'm in it right now. You just never know what's going to happen in your life. I mean, you end up being a voice that it finds its way into so many people's lives in so many different circumstances. Mm -hmm. They're lost. They are just, they can't think of the name of that actor. Right. And they ask Siri, (laughs) what has been the most surprising thing about your life? Oh, Siri. No question. (laughs) No question. The thing that was so unusual about Siri is you have to remember that Siri was the, uh, probably the first public manifestation of AI. Mm. She was the first concatenated voice, and I'll explain what that means in a second, that you could interact with and that sounded human. Concatenation is the process by which the recorded voice went to into being Siri. We, those of us that did this kind of work, read thousands of phrases and sentences that were created just for sound. And so these phrases were really weird. They made no sense, like fossa, ask fossa, ask fussy, things like that, just crazy stuff. And we read those for weeks and weeks and months on end. After that was done, technicians and computers went into the recordings, extracted sounds, reformed these sounds into new phrases and sentences, and those are what ended up on our devices. 
And so all of these GPS voices, Siri, Alexa, Cortana, all these voices came from those types of IVR recordings. And so Siri was the first one. And so basically the way I look at it, you know, it was such a surprise because we were, to, you know, it was really breaking new ground. Mm -hmm. You know, we went from business as usual in the past to whoops, brand new technology and a whole new way of dealing with the world. Yeah. So it was a, it was a surprising thing. It was an unexpected thing for me personally. It was a huge life lesson, but ultimately as often as life lessons are, they can turn around to be a very positive thing for you, which is what happened with me. So I'm, I, I can be very grateful to Siri. So. <laughs> hmm. Would you say that in your life, you have followed your bliss more than others, or have there been moments where you really weren't sure of what direction you were going? Or Oh, yeah, I've never really been sure. <laughs> the only thing that I was sure of is that I was born with musical talent, and uh, I, could play the, I could play melodies on a piano at the age of four. And so I knew that somehow that was going to be a part of my life. But I didn't realize, you know, as when I was growing up, I didn't realize that you could make a living doing that. You know, so that was kind of a revelation. I got married very young the first time uh, right out of college. And my first husband was an NHL hockey player. And he got traded to Atlanta as one of the first members of the Atlanta Flames years and years ago. So when I moved to Atlanta, you know, suddenly I started to, to do more with my music and sing out in public and that sort of thing. And I went around to all the different studios and started to sing background vo vocals and, and jingles and things like that. I've just been very fortunate in my life that I didn't have to go and get a job that I really didn't want to do. I, I, you know, thanks to my, my husband's great career, my first husband's great career, I had the time to figure out exactly what I wanted to do, or I could get into music and gradually build that career without having to worry about, you know, eating, <laughs> you hmm. know, making enough money to survive. So I've been very, very, very fortunate. We'll knock wood on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that there are any misconceptions about you? I'm sure there are, you know, because none of us really knows anyone else mm -hmm. completely. And so you can yeah, I surmise certain things from listening to my interviews or seeing me speak. But I'm actually, and I talk about this in my presentation, I'm, I'm actually more of an introvert mm -hmm. than an extrovert. I can, I can rise to the occasion because of course I've been a performer all my life, but I'm, I'm one of those ones if, that if given the opportunity to go to a party or stay home and read a book nine times out of 10, I'd probably choose the book, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, it depends on the situation. What would you say has been a challenge that you faced as an introvert? Um, probably Siri, once again, was the biggest challenge mm. because in my career as a voice actor, you know, I could kind of stay in my little cocoon there because, mm. um, I didn't have to be out in front of people. I didn't have to be on the stage. I would just, you know, go into the recording studios and then in the, from the last 20 years, just stay home in my booth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was very fortunate for an introverted person. Siri changed all of that. And I knew that she was going to change all of that, which is why it took me two whole years to reveal myself as the voice. I wasn't sure how much fame I was going to have to contend with. I wasn't sure how much public, you know, interaction I was going to have to go through. So I, it really took me a long time. Finally, my husband and son said, look, you are missing out on this incredible, <laughs> unique opportunity. And they were right. So one day the stars just aligned and I decided, okay, yeah, I need to do this. Well, what has been the best thing, the, the greatest blessing about having come forward that Susan C. Bennett saying, I am the voice of Siri? <laughs> well, there have been um, a couple of things. The first thing that really comes to mind is that because of my wonderful son who lives in Los Angeles, Cam Bennett um, is a photographer. And when I first did my interview on the CNN morning show and... I came home from New York and I had like 500 emails and, you know, hundreds of phone calls. And I'm just going, oh my God, I, I don't know how to deal with this. Mm. I just didn't think that my local agents, you know, would be able to deal with, with that sort of thing. And so I asked my son and, and he found my agent for me, uh, the wonderful Wes Stevens at Vox Inc. in Los Angeles. 
and Wes and his uh, business partner, Tom Lawless, and their whole fabulous staff uh, really got behind me. And Wes basically, you know, started this whole new branch of his agency for me, in a sense, uh, because mm. he books all of my speaker events at this point in time. So that was a huge thing for me that I got an agent in Los Angeles that had a bigger reach, mm-hmm. you know, and was able to 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 follow through on some of these national things that were ha- that were about to happen. So that was a fabulous thing. The second thing was that, as I said, I, I had this amazing life lesson that I had to learn to to deal with it. And it's one of the things I talk about in my presentations is that we all have to deal with the unexpected, hmm. you know, at times in our lives. And sometimes it it's, it's kind of traumatic, you know, having to deal with the certain things that, well, this isn't going away. So what are you going to do about this? Mm -hmm. You know? And so I finally thought, well, you know, I need to embrace this and figure out a way to really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And so the speaker, you know, becoming a public speaker has, has been the result of that. And I'm having a ball doing it, doing it. It's great. Mm. (laughs) It's a lot of fun. I remember an interview I did with Livingston Taylor and he was talking about his brother, James. And he said, he said, fame is like hot sauce. A little of it can be very nice. A lot of it can be very corrosive. Right. Has that kind of been your experience? Is it nice to have this little bit of fame? Like, Or maybe it is a lot of fame. I don't know. Yeah, I don't really know because I, you know, I don't, that's not important to me. I mean, it's important. I really enjoy relating to the people who really appreciate Siri and we laugh about the fact that, oh, she doesn't understand us. And, I, you know, I enjoy those interactions that I have at the different speaker events. And it's and it's really fun to be able to talk about Siri and make jokes and just have a good time with it. I don't think it, and I don't, I know that I haven't experienced the corrosive part because that's one of the nice things. People yeah. don't really know who I am. I mean, I can walk around, no one knows me. I mean, I've had one person recognize me in all these years. Hmm. So I, I do still have anonymity and I don't have to be put upon by, you know, photographers all the time and, you know, interview. I do a lot of interviews, but they're, they're usually very personal Mm -hmm. and, you know, non-intrusive like this one. (laughs) So I think I, I think I have, you know, the the little bit of fame thing is, has been, uh, I would say definitely tolerable and at times even fun. So (laughs) it's interesting that so often, although you're the person behind this voice, Sometimes people think of Siri as a real person. Mm -hmm. One time, like you were just saying, like it can be sometimes frustrating if she doesn't understand what we're saying. I got really frustrated because I was trying to say something and I was driving. And my wife, Karina, said, don't talk to her like that. (laughs) I'm serious. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you wouldn't believe the number of people who, when they meet me, say, oh, I'm so sorry for those things I said to you. And I just say, don't worry. I know where you live. (laughs) Do worry. I know where you live. (laughs) Well, I think we all get frustrated with Siri because we live in such an ADD society. We expect things to be instantaneous. And you forget that it took decades. Hmm. People have been working on AI since... I think maybe the late 50s, the 60s, and just, you know, in 2011, it finally came to fruition. So, I mean, it's a complicated business. It's really complex. And um, I did an interview. I I went to Australia not too long ago, and I did an interview at a radio station. They said, well, we want to talk about Siri because we think Siri has become a slacker. Mm. You know, when we ask Siri questions now, instead of giving us an answer, she just says, well, I found these options. <laughs> and, you know, you're driving a, a car and it's like, well, I can't look at the options. Tell me the options, <laughs> you know. And so it, it's, you know, all of the technology is keeps going through, you know, renovation and, and improvement. And uh, but we do expect a lot of Siri. And what I like to tell people is, please don't take it personally that she doesn't recognize you or she doesn't understand you. She doesn't understand me, and I'm Siri. (laughs) (laughs) One of the questions that my wife wanted to know was, they changed the voice of Siri. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why did they do that? I don't know. I'm sure that uh, 
the original voice, when you listen to the original voice on the iPhone 4S, you, it still sounds quite robotic mm-hmm. in comparison to the current Siri. And I heard a difference in the voice basically with operating system 7, which was on the iPhone 5S. Now, I've heard two stories, and both of these came from Siri, so I don't know. She's contradicting herself. <laughs> They either manipulated my voice to sound different or they had another voice actor. And after, you know, the the initial original series were promoting ourselves because we didn't have NDAs, you know, Apple, when they chose the new voices, they put them under exclusivity and non, you know, non-disclosure agreements. And so there's no way to really know about that. I suppose if you want to really, really research there, there must be an answer there. But definitely starting with the iPhone X, the Siri voice became a millennial. She's, her voice is much higher pitched and she's much more casual sounding. In fact, it's really hard to tell the difference between all those voices now. Google, Alexa, and Siri sound pretty similar. And I'm not sure if that's intentional or not. And, uh, you know, Hmm. certainly I have no idea. (laughs) We're recording this interview in Atlanta, and it's an interesting city. You know, Mm -hmm. it's been called by some people the city in the woods. Mm -hmm. What do you like about Atlanta? Well, it's, it's changed a lot in the last five years especially, but even 10 years. For a really long time, it was a, it was a growing city. I love it. The fact that it has rolling hills and tons of trees. I love that about Atlanta. But it was kind of like a a big, friendly city, you know. And now it's becoming, now that we're about, I think, six and a half million people uh, and lots and lots of people transplanted from other areas, that it's certainly become more cosmopolitan. And, and certainly we've seen definite advancements in, well, especially in the film and TV industry. And we have all kinds of fabulous production you know, facilities here now and lots and lots of work for people in that business. And our museum has gone through, uh, we have a fabulous museum now, which really came about after the Olympics, I'd have to say for the Olympics, they had a fabulous, and they've just, they've just been growing and doing wonderfully ever since. So, you know, now Atlanta's home. I mean, I was born Mm. in Vermont, but I've lived here since 1972. So I consider Atlanta home. I, and I really do like Atlanta. I, I can't say I like the traffic. Yeah. No No, kidding. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it's, and it's really, really sad that, you know, someone will say, well, well, let's meet up for some coffee. And you both look at your watches and go, oh, well, never mind. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Never mind. It'll take me two hours to get there. So no, not today. Very true. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What is the best thing about being Susan Bennett? Well, I consider myself very, very fortunate. I'm very fortunate to have a great marriage, um, and I'm very fortunate to have a beautiful son and great friends. I'd have to say that the biggest, one of the biggest things that I'm most grateful for is music. Mm. Yeah, because music to me is just magical. I think it's the best of humanity. All of art and creativity, I think, is the best of humanity, but Music even seems to be a step a step above that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite all-time song? No, I really don't. There are some songs that, that really, really, really speak to me. That's How Strong My Love Is by the Rolling Stones. As I said, a Fortress Around Your Heart by Sting. Mariah Carey song, um, Something About a Friend. Gosh, the title escapes me at the moment. But... I have a lot of different songs that I really love. Um, Anyone Who Had a Heart, I just absolutely love that song. Yeah. Mostly it's older things, I guess. You know, with the technology, if you have a particular type of music that you like, you know, you have your little devices and all your favorite Mm. stuff is on that. And so I don't really, I'm not really exposed to a whole lot of of newer music, actually, you know, because I'm I'm kind of stuck in my, (laughs) what are my favorites, you know? That's true for me, and I was born in the 80s. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. I wanted to also go back, and I'm hoping you can tell us your recollections of appearing on The Letterman Show. You're, you're reading the, the top ten list. Yeah. Well, I didn't actually appear. It was a weird situation, actually. And, in fact, it, was, uh, it led to kind of a, a funny episode of The Letterman Show. I had just flown home from New York. And they wanted me to fly back to do the Letterman show. And I was scheduled to go to Los Angeles. 
And I said, well, gee, gosh, I just came back from New York. Instead of going to New York, maybe I could just record the, the top 10 list in my booth. And they said, yeah, yeah, that'll work. That's great. And so I, that's what I did. And it became a really big deal. Dave made a big deal of it. First of all, he didn't realize that I, that he didn't realize that he wasn't reading the top 10 list. Ugh. And so his guest right after this, you know, segment was Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks said, Oh, didn't make it to rehearsal, Dave, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so he didn't realize that he wasn't reading the list. And then after he realized that I was reading the list, um, or I had read the list and he played it. You know, they, there was all sorts of commentary about, oh, Susan Bennett from Atlanta, Georgia. She couldn't be bothered to come to New York uh -huh. to the Letterman show. <laughs> so I took a little flack for that. But, yeah. I always like to end the interview. I just like to give the guest the stage. Completely limitless. You could go anywhere you want. What would you say to anyone who is tuned in? What you say is there's no boundary. You could, what would you say to anyone listening on anything? Oh. Completely open-ended. Oh, oh. I would have to say we are living in the age of blah, 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 blah. Hmm. And in the past, there used to be a saying, and I'm going to sound like I'm 900 years. I'm going to talk to you about what it used to be like. And that was silence is golden. <laughs> And, uh, you know, don't, don't say, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything. Well, you know, that was one extreme to the other. But now it is like we, we feel free to say anything hmm. to anybody. And I don't know. I just think it would be better to find a little happy medium there. You know, you don't necessarily have to express every thought that you have. In fact, please don't. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think we just need to be nicer to each other. We're not all ever going to totally agree, ever. And so just let it go. You know, it doesn't mean you can't still like that person. You know, my ex-husband used to have this fabulous phrase. He says, you get into trouble so much because you want, you want to like a hundred percent of a person. Hmm. He said, so you get into this. He said, just take that part you like and don't worry about the rest. And it's so true. Hmm. You know, I mean, I think we'd have a much more pleasant life experience if everyone would just do that. You know, just shut up a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Well, Susan Bennett, thank you very much for agreeing to do this interview, having me in your home. This is a great way to start the year 2020. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. You, um, This was a very fun interview, and you asked some different questions. Thank you very so, yeah, much. Yeah. Enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Siri enjoyed it, too. <laughs> what a kick. <laughs> <laughs> the boop, bop. Deep pop, a doodly, keep pop, doodly, shop pop, a dingy daka. Ooh, no, I just think it up, a zizzle like a pom, tong, cook it to be, a zizzle a pock, a tom, pumpkin, tom, con, pom, to goodle, con, to goodle, loop, a boodle, boom. Goodbye.